So as you all know, individuals with myotonic dystrophy um, results in a progressive loss of muscular strength over time. Um, and we also know that inactivity and aging also result in loss of muscle strength. We lose about a kilogram of lean muscle mass per year after the age of 40, just from the aging process. So inactivity, um, or physical activity and exercise are essential in minimizing strength loss, secondary to disuse, inactivity and aging, and so important for maximizing functional abilities, such as getting out of chairs, walking, climbing stairs. First, what I'd like to do is review the physical activity guidelines that were put out by the Center of Disease Control um, as part of the Healthy 2020 Vision, um, Healthy People 2020 Vision. And what these guidelines state, well, and I guess the reason I'm starting with these guidelines in particular is that there are many people with myotonic dystrophy who may be minimally affected and that these guidelines would actually apply to. So these guidelines state that at a minimum, Aerobic training should be performed at a moderate intensity level for two hours and 30 minutes per week, which is 150 minutes, which is five days of 30 minutes, which actually you can break down into 10 minute segments and still be beneficial, so 15 10 minute segments a week. It also states that people should um, engage in resistive exercise involving all major muscle groups at least two times a week. And the question that I often get asked is, what is moderate intensity? And moderate intensity is really the level of exercise that you can still carry on a conversation with, but you wouldn't be able to sing. So it's intense enough that you can't have enough breath support to sing, but you, you can still talk. Some examples of that would be brisk walking, um, water aerobics classes or water activities, bicycling, ballroom dancing, and gardening. The physical activity guidelines also state and have a statement for individuals with disabilities. And what it says is that follow the adult guidelines. If this is not possible, people should be as physically active as their abilities allow, and they should avoid inactivity. As a physical therapist, I, working with individuals with myotonic dystrophy, I'm often asked, will it harm my condition? Will it make me worse? And, and I think there's been enough evidence in the recent years to, to say no. Um, and I wanted to at least review that evidence so that people were aware of it. The, there's been a Cochrane Review published, which is the high, highest level of um, literature and evidence um, base that says that modern intensity strength training um, appears to do no harm. There's level two evidence, which is likely to be effective for strength training and combination with aerobic exercise for patients with muscle disorders, um, including myotonic dystrophy. And then lastly, aerobic training is safe and can improve uh, fitness effectively in patients with myotonic dystrophy. Um, the terms physical activity and exercise are often used interchangeably, so I wanted to just take a minute and um, at least define both of those terms so that people understand the differences. Physical activity in daily life can be categorized into occupational activities, sports, conditioning, household activities, or other activities. Whereas exercise is a subset of physical activity. It's considered the planned, structured, repetitive, and has a final or intermediate objective of improving or maintaining physical fitness. So exercise is just a piece of physical activity. And so when we talk about physical activity guidelines, we're talking about all activity, everything we do every day. And that's really important to think about. As far as exercise goes, we, then this is the more planned, structured kind of things. It's broken down into three different categories. Stretching is a form of exercise. Stretching is always often used to increase range of motion or flexibilities of the, of the muscles and the joints. Um, and then there's strengthening activities, which is more of the resistive activities, looking at um, improving strength or maintaining strength. And then aerobic activity, which is more of that increasing your heart rate, um, cardiovascular exercise. There are known benefits of physical activity and exercise. 
Um, physical activity and exercise can control your, help you control your weight. It reduces cardiovascular disease, reduces your risk for type 2 diabetes and the metabolic syndrome, reduces your risk for some type of cancers, strengthens bones and muscles, improves your mental health and mood. You can just ask my husband if I don't get a little bit of exercise every day, I become a little bit of a bear. So <laughs> I'm always for promoting that um, benefit of exercise because I personally find a lot of um, benefit from it. Um, it improves your ability to do daily activities, and that's so important in a patient population where, where strength loss is a, an issue. Um, we're looking to maximize functional ability, make sure that you can get out of chairs well, walk to the best of your abilities. Um, so that's really important. And it increases your chances of living longer, and I think that's just the overall society aspect that we've been um, hearing about. Um, this study is um, important to point out. So this is, um, I did not include this in the evidence-based um, for physical ac activity because this is a retrospective study, and retrospective studies um, are considered less rigorous. Um, but there also can be important messages in them. So a retrospective study is basically a study that goes back and looks at data or chart reviews to answer a research question. And the, the reason that they're less rigorous is it's really difficult in those situations to have any control of any other variables. Um, so in this study, and this was in 2014, so just a year ago, um, they looked at the differences in strength of individuals with myotonic dystrophy type 1 who were habitually active and compared them to individuals that were uh, more sedentary and weren't engaging in physical activity. And what they found is that individuals with mid-range CTG repeats, so 100 to 500, um, who were engaged in, engaged in regular exercise programs demonstrated stronger grip, stronger elbow flexors, so that's bending your elbow, and stronger knee, knee extensor strength, which is kicking your leg out, than their sedentary counterparts. I think that's really important for us to kind of keep in mind. And then they looked at individuals who began an exercise program while during that review period of, of when they were re reviewing the data. And what they found is those that began an exercise program during the review period demonstrated a 24% gain in strength in their knee extensor strength. So again, I think sometimes, and, and uh, again, this is a retrospective study, so we have to kind of take it um, as that. But um, it's, you know, so many people will sometimes ask, well, I have a muscle disease, I'm not going to gain strength. But the thing that we're looking at is that there's a strength loss, like I said at the beginning, associated with disuse and associated with aging. And that's the type of strength that we can change. We may not be able to change the strength because of a disease process, but we can reduce um, strength loss secondary to disuse and aging. Okay, and I think that's what we see here with this improvement of strength. I'm not always clicking the right button. And I think the other, other extreme of that is really the evidence that's mounting against um, the, de or the explaining the detrimental effects of being sedentary and, s and spending a lot of time in sitting. And so we really want to minimize a sedentary lifestyle. We did a study back at the MDF meeting in 2012. I'm sure many of you participated in it. And we looked at physical activities and the barriers to physical activity in individuals with myotonic dystrophy. And what we found in this, in this data that we collected is that individuals with myotonic dystrophy spend about seven, seven and a half hours per day sitting. Um, and that's not counting the, the sleeping time as well, um, which is pretty scary, um, you know, but I also can say there's a lot of us in society that are also dealing with that. It's, it's hard. You spend an eight-hour day at work sitting at a desk. You're also sitting for eight hours. So um, I think what we're really trying to say is be as physically active as you are able to be and, and get up and move around. So even if you do have a more sedentary lifestyle, getting up every 10 minutes, going to get yourself a drink, doing something during a commercial um, on a uh, TV program, just getting up and moving around regularly will help. So the other piece to that study was really um, looking to overcome or looking at what the barriers to physical activity are in individuals with myotonic dystrophy. And the two top barriers that were reported were lack of motivation and fatigue and lack of energy. Um, so this is some, some things to think about from um, how do we overcome those and what are suggestions to overcome those. 
things. And I think the thing is everyone's individual. What works for one person may not work for another person. Um, there's a lot of the research going on that wor what works for men doesn't work for women. And so just, just to, these are a couple of ideas just to kind of think about. Plan ahead. You know, make physical activity a regular part of your day. Put it on your schedule. You know, every night before my husband and I go to bed, it, it, we ask each other, what's your plan for tomorrow? What are you going to do? And it, we hold each other accountable, and that's, that's helpful. You know, we know what, what and, and we help each other schedule out that time. And we have two young ki kids, so somebody has to take the kids while the other person's exercising. Um, plan ahead. My exercise clothes, I happen to be a morning person. I realize that's not the case for a lot of you in this room. But my exercise clothes are on the floor when my alarm goes off, and I get up and put them on. And so again, it's just little things in my world that help me meet the goals. Um, invite a friend to exercise. And that's, um, when I say there's gender differences, that's something that women, and the literature has really shown that women really prefer to exercise with a buddy. And again, we're talking physical activity. It may be just going for a walk with a friend, jumping on a bike with a friend. You know, even if it's a stationary bike at the gym, you can sit there and talk with your friend while you're exercising, which is just a great way of doing it. You know, throw an exercise bike in front of a television and watch your favorite television program. Um, there's just lots of ways to, to plan and, and um, increase your motivation to exercise. Um, the last one is join an exercise group, group or a class. Um, again, I know that may be sometimes challenging for individuals, but I think the important thing to know is with um, any exercise group instructor, is you don't ever have to finish the class. You can always modify the class. So don't feel like I, I can't go to that because I can't spend an hour exercising. Go in there and do 10 minutes of it, and that's fine. I mean, that happens regularly in a gym setting. Um, yoga sessions, et cetera, all sorts of things. Fatigue and lack of energy. Um, schedule um, physical activity for a time of day where it fits and, and you have enough energy. So. Um, if there's a day that you are running around all day long, you're gone out of the house, things are busy, that's not necessarily the day that you spend 30 minutes of exercise and exercising. You choose to do that on a day where you are more sedentary, where not, when you're not doing as much activity. Okay? Um, and the other piece is give yourself, <laughs> convince yourself to give it a chance. Probably easier said than done. But physical activity has been shown to actually increase energy levels and fatigue levels. And it, you have to give it time to do, do that because the first bit of time that you're actually exercising and putting it into your schedule, you probably will feel a little bit more fatigued. But over time, that should improve. The other piece that I have to say about that is for people that come to see me from a research perspective um, that are performing the six-minute walk test, and I haven't looked at this data um, statistically at all, but so often when people report their fatigue before and after the six-minute walk test, they actually report their fatigue less after the six-minute walk test. So that means that little burst of energy that you use when you get up and walk for six minutes, you actually feel better afterwards. And I think that's important to keep in mind. Like I said, you can, only, you can do 10-minute bursts, and that's effective. So you don't have to go out for 40 minutes of exercise. That can be daunting. So just start with little bursts and try to get get up and be more energetic. I think this is where we're going to switch here, but we'll keep going. Yeah, I can go to my next slides, which, let's see. So as a physical therapist, we play um, a big role in um, health and wellness as well. So you don't always have to have an injury to come see a, or to go see a physical therapist. Um, we, we look at things from a health and wellness perspective all the time, and I think that's probably one of the things that I love most about my profession. Um, when you go to see a physical therapist, though, they can help you design and think about how to incorporate physical activity and exercise into your life. We perform evaluations, so we go through and we test your range of motion and your strength um, throughout your entire body. We may, um, and then we look at your overall mobility. How are you walking? What are things that we can help with from that perspective? We may um, incorporate a specific intervention. So say if somebody has um, tight calf muscles, we may instruct a specific stretch to help increase those, the range of motion in the ankles. Um, and so that we may give a specific individual uh, prescription to, to address some of the impairments that we may see. 
Um, the other thing that we do then is make recommendations. We take into account what your current health status is, how are you walking, what are you doing during the day, um, how fatigued are you. Um, we look at work and family demands. You know, a, a young mother ra racing around two young children, you know, is often exhausted, and, and that's a lot of physical activity in general. So how do we put physical activity into that li lifestyle? And then we look at interests, and I think that probably could go back even to the motivation piece, is find things that you like to do, and that's important, and that's something that we'll always ask about as a physical therapist. You know, what do you enjoy? How can I help you meet take what your, what your current status is and find things that you enjoy and incorporate it into your lifestyle. Um, we spend a lot of time in education, both um, in educating individuals about their activities and we also will help educate other practitioners. So many times, um, you know, I'll see somebody from a physical therapy perspective and they'll be working with a trainer at the gym, they'll be working with a yoga therapist, a Pilates instructor, and they'll say to me, well, but they don't know anything about myotonic dystrophy. So I spend a lot of time just educating um, other healthcare professionals, other um, practitioners in the community about myotonic dystrophy and what does that mean for exercise and what does that mean for an individual that has weakness in certain muscles. Again, often just giving the global picture of myotonic dystrophy, not necessarily the individual picture. Um, we can also help people um, in monitoring their condition. So we may set up an exercise program and I may say, yeah, come check in with me, you know, in six weeks. Let's see how it's going and be able to tweak it and mod modify it if necessary. And we also instruct individuals how to monitor themselves, how to monitor their heart rate, how to monitor their progress, um, you know, how to keep daily di um, diaries or journals to track their progress. Um, so there's a lot of ways that um, just consulting with a physical therapist can help you with achieving your um, physical activity goals. Um, there's an endless list of physical activities. There's so many things that you can do. Um, and like I said, mowing your lawn, we consider that as long as it's a moderate intensity exercise or moderate intensity level, you know that's a act physical, physical activity. There are lots of activities that you can consider, and I guess I put this list up here, one, to remind people to find things that work for you. Find things that you enjoy, that you will continue to do on a regular basis. Um, I also put this list up here because these are activities that, in working with individuals with myotonic dystrophy, that people have reported are helpful, are easy, easier to engage in, are more user-friendly, I guess I would say. Um, and that's, you know, doing yoga, um, Pilates. Um, a lot of that looks at range of motion, looks at core strengthening, so your muscles in your abdominal region, which are often unaffected by the disease, but are often affected by our inactivity. <laughs> so really important to, to keep those toned up to help us from a functional standpoint. Um, cycling is a great ex exercise because cycling, again, in a condition that often affects distal weakness of the muscles at the, um, the lower part of your leg. Cycling actually pulls in the muscles that are up uh, your, more, your thighs and your um, hips. And those muscles are often the muscles that we use for functional activities like getting out of a chair. Um, and keeping those muscles nice and strong are really important. Um, aquatic exercise, aquatics are a great um, venue for exercise. Um, it gives you, allows you to have a cardiovascular response. Um, the buoyancy of the water supports muscles that are weaker. Um, but the resistance of the water can actually help muscles get a little bit stronger too. So it's a great environment. It doesn't necessarily have to be swimming laps. It can be water walking. It can be putting an aqua jog belt on and going into the deep end and just uh, doing some light um, like water jogging. Um, you can just do, um, and, and my, Mike will go over lots of things that he does in the pool, but you can just do, um, you know, kickboarding. There, there's lots of different things that you can do in the water. Using weights, definitely not off limits for people with muscle disease. Um, the, the guidance that we often give individuals um, from a uh, safety standpoint as far as moderate intensity is when you're lifting weights, you want to lift a weight that you can lift at least, at least 10 to 12, 15 times. So that many repetitions of using the weight. If you can't do that with a weight, then you need to lower the weight. Um, and that's just really kind of keeping with the, the modern intensity guidelines. Um, and then using your body weight or doing functional exercises. For example, 
when I say do something during the commercial break, you can stand up from your chair 10 times, and I give that a, a big bonus for just moving and, and engaging those more proximal muscles in a functional way. Um, so I guess the, the big point is find things that were helpful, felt helpful to you, are things that you enjoy, and that um, you can continue on over time. So this is um, just a couple of pictures that were put together of um, individuals with myotonic dystrophy doing all sorts of different um, things. And, and again, there's a range of abilities and a range of activities. I think we have dancing, we have some running with fire, um, <laughs> and uh, some cycling, so you have an upright um, exercise bike, you have a recumbent bike. Again, for different people, for people with different level of, of abilities, um, you know, the upright bike will help you pull core musculature in again because you have to sit up and stabilize yourself, whereas a recumbent bike might be beneficial for people who have back pain. And the upper one is, I think, just some ba probably balance exercises with a medicine ball. Um, rowing machines, um, again, dancing, things with exercise balls, uh, resistance training, you know, functional training, all sorts of activities. Like I said, the list of things that you can do is endless. Whoops, sorry, Mike. Can you quickly describe the work of that? Sure, I can do that. Um, so, my, this is, these are some pictures of Mike, and he'll go through and, and discuss them and his experience with aquatic <laughs> exercise. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Mike Hamlin. I live now in Key West, Florida, although I used to live here in D.C. Um, now that's me there in uh, a bathing suit. Try to control yourselves. Um, in the pool at the condo development where I live in Key West, Florida. After I got uh, my diagnosis with DM1, um, I could remain active for a while, but certainly my upper body strength my abdominals, my face muscles, lips, hands, everything has, have degenerated significantly. And I got down because I had been active, going to the gym, riding bikes, long bike rides. A good friend of mine here helped me do a really long one once. And it was hard to um, stay focused on what's positive when you were cast, when, when the difference between what I was and am now was in so stark a contrast with what I'd been. So I cast around for some things to do. Yoga was great. We've heard that mentioned. Uh, I like that for the um, peace that it gave me as well as the great stretches. Um, I, I walked, uh, and I had a great neighborhood for doing that, but couldn't do it so much in the winter because uh, it was so cold, and the cold got to my myotonia pretty badly. So I moved to Key West. And, um, and then a physical therapist helped me round out the program with something that was a real challenge for me and something that I could do, and it's in the pool. Um, and he designed for me um, a series of exercises that start slow and then work up and get to the, the points that you were talking about, Katie. The first one there is me walking. Uh, I use one of those floaty things, and what I'm doing is pushing down on it. I've got a little forward bend going that engages my stomach muscles. Um, and if I want to engage them more, I lean more forward. Again, I'm in a safe situation. All I'm going to do is fall over in the water and I get myself up if I slip or something. So it's not like I'm on a sidewalk trying to do the same thing. I do that going forward in the first frame and then going backward in the second. And that's both um, works the side muscles. What do you call those obliques? Yeah, <laughs> obliques and my stomach muscles. Um, I, the, the technique there is to one foot in front of your other uh, as, as straight a line as you can get and walk as fast as you can. So I start out slow but get going. Later on, the third slide, I uh, work on my quadricep muscles by, and if you could change to the next slide, uh -huh, I actually take the um, floaty thing and I do uh, push down crunches with each leg. I try to do 50 of those. Um, and the way I do it is to push down with the leg, put my neck down, and then bring my neck all the way up and inhale as deeply as I can. So I'm getting good breath there. And at the same time, um, in an integrated way, working my neck muscles and my leg muscles. Um, 
Later on, I do a breaststroke. That's the middle one uh, in the pool, just like you think a breaststroke would be, like this. Bring it back very slowly and get the hands flat out. So I'm creating, uh, creating as much resistance as I can. Um, and then finally, my favorite one is where I get to swim. Um, as you can see, the floaty there is under my um, armpits, through, you know, under my back, and I backstroke. Um, I can get my heart rate up to about 125. Uh, I can, and so I'm, it's at the point where I'm having to work on my breathing. You're just not breathing along there. You gotta think about fully filling up your lungs and expelling the air, getting it going. Um, and I try to do that for about 20 minutes, keep it at 120 for about 20 minutes. Um, and I went to the dock on this trip to Washington. I still come here to see the docks. And you did an EKG yesterday, and um, things look really good. So I'm, I'm really pleased with that. Um, so those are the mechanics of it. But let me tell you the most important thing about it. Um, you would know more about the science of this than me, Katie. But there are these things called endorphins. Wow. <laughs> they, they are really cool. And I get a good buzz. You can get a really good buzz after you do the, the full exercises. One that keeps you focused and invigorated and ready to go. And in Key West, where everything's flat, I walk about three miles a day now. And I've not been able to do that for a while. Um, and so that's one big takeaway, is that the incentive that you may need to keep on going is from that almost addictive uh, endorphin rush that I get that I like so much, and it's very empowering. Empowering to go out uh, and do my walking. I can practice what I call bailout moves in the pool, going up a step, going down a step. What happens if I'm on the sidewalk, it's uneven, maybe I don't pick up my foot all the way and trip. Um, I've got some moves practice to help me fall down, hopefully in a way that wouldn't be um, life-changing, let's put it that way. And that's happened a couple of times. You know, there's a little rise there where a tree root is, and you fall down. Well, I try to fall down on my butt so that I don't do a hip or an arm or, or, or something like that. Um, and then the final point to make is the empowerment of it. Um, it gives me the head strength as well as some muscle strength, a little confidence to go out and engage the world and um, help make some differences. So I'm enjoying it. To, it has benefits even beyond the physical things. Maybe the most important things are those beyond the physical things. Thank you. Thanks. So I'm, I'm just going to say, well, I'm going to read a script, and then you can play my video. Okay. So my, my main form of exercise for the past uh, over 20 years has been a yoga practice. And now it's pretty much gentle and restorative yoga. And I, being a female, I prefer attending group classes. I like that uh, camaraderie in the class, being part of the social aspects of being in a group. And um, a friend from my local support group uh, told me about her Pilates practice. I think mm -hmm. she's in the room somewhere. And I was very uh, intrigued by it. So about a year ago, I joined the local gym and they have a small studio with Pilates reformers. That's that machine thing there. And um, I decided, what the heck. Uh, they offer one-to-one -one training with a Pilates instructor. It's a little uh, intimidating because of that one-to-one -one intensity. I didn't really want all that focus on me. Uh, I like to sit in the back of a classroom, but I really wanted to work on my core muscles. So uh, I <clears throat> met with this Pilates instructor, and of course she never heard of myotonic dystrophy, right? So to help start her education, because we're always educating people about DM, um, I printed a copy of an article from the MDF Toolkit. The name of it is Role of Physical Therapy in the Assessment and Management of Individuals with Myotonic Dystrophy, and of course Katie co-wrote it. And I gave it to the, to the Pilates instructor. She's not a PT, but there's a similar language that uh, you know, she was familiar with. And we embarked on this learning process together. And Pilates is very different from anything I've ever done before. And it's really helped me. Um, there are things I 
can't do and will never be able to do on that reformer, but I feel the changes in my core muscles, and I could get up from a seated position with more ease. Now, please don't like watch at the end of this and, and, and judge how I get up. I might use some leverage, but trust me, it's helping. And that was really my goal, was to strengthen and maintain my core muscles and thus prolong independence. And, and you know how that helps with ADLs, activities of daily living. So this is, um, I did a short video of a session, actually just about 16 minutes of it, and I sent the video clip to Katie, and she selected a few of the uh, segments to focus on to uh, to focus on different areas of strengthening and alignment. So we'll just play the clip through, and then maybe you can uh, speak to it. There is volume. Guys, um, to press out, use the backs of your legs. So engage your glutes. So really, really squeeze your butt. Good, and press the carriage out. Good, that's much better. Good. <laughs> now reach your shoulders away. Good. Inhale as you extend your right leg out. Exhale, scoop the belly. Use the belly to bring that right knee back in. Good. Inhale, left. Exhale, back in. Inhale, right. Left. Don't let the shoulders creep up. Right. And left. <laughs> Do you want to speak to that at all? Um, I think both are excellent examples of individuals with myotonic dystrophy engaging in physical activity and exercise. They're fabulous. Um, in the video, the things that I think the Pilates instructor were focusing on, and you saw with the titles, is really core strength, quad strength, glute strength. Those are all muscles that are not commonly affected in myotonic dystrophy, at least early on, or muscles that can still be engaged um, more so than the lower leg. Um, and I think, you know, Leslie spoke to the um, importance of the core strength in everything we do. When you reach for something in the cupboard, you engage your core strength. And core strength helps in all your posture. Core strength helps in your balance. So it's really important to engage core activities, and sometimes they're challenging to do in other settings. So where I think yoga, Pilates, aquatic exercise, you are definitely engaging um, your core muscles in the things that you are doing as well. So there's lots of mediums to do that. Um, so I think they're both just awesome, awesome examples. Um, Should we go, go to ahead. the last slide and yeah. have Q&A? Yep, I think that would be great. I apologize for the yoga therapist not being here. Uh, yes. We were planning to do some interactive uh, chair yoga. But since time is, is critical, um, we can yeah. just have Q&A. Sure. Um, so the last slide that I had was just uh, tips for improving physical activity, and those are some of the things we've, we've definitely talked about, but more of a summary is obviously always consult your health care <coughs> providers, um, especially in my time. Just free where cardiac involvement is present, um, it's already always important to make sure that you have a recent EKG, um, especially before you begin any new exercise. Um, Engage a physical therapist if you're not sure where to start. And I think, you know, Mike, you, you mentioned that, you know, you worked with a physical therapist to set this program up. And it doesn't mean you need ongoing physical therapists, but you needed some guidance of where to start. So um, as a physical therapist, we're, we're definitely more than happy to help with those kind of things. Um, I've I said this multiple times, find things that you enjoy, you know. Playing basketball, not something I enjoy. <laughs> That's not something I would go out and do on a regular basis, you know. Um, so you just have to find things that you would continue to do over time. 
do as much as you can, and that's really stating, going back to the physical activity um, guidelines, is do as much as you're physically able to do. Set goals. Um, I think we're all goal-oriented goal people, and if we have something that, just a little target that we can try to hit, and that may be, you know, just spending one less hour on the couch a day, or, you know, um, getting up on every commercial break, or, you know, riding a, a bicycle for 30 minutes. I mean, the goals can be all over the place, and no goal is too minimal to set. Um, and seek encouragement from supporters, um, friends, families, physical therapists. Um, you know, I like to be that cheerleader. I like to help people, you know, accomplish their goals that they set. Um, and I think, you know, friends and family, if you seek them out and say, you know, I'm really going to try this. Can you help me? You know, they'll, they'll be there as well. Um, and I think at this point, we're finished with the things that we'd like to present, but definitely would welcome um, any questions that individuals may have. Do we have a microphone? For Oh, sorry. That she has. So I was. I'm here as a friend, so on. And so my friend was told very clearly that um, if she did too much exercise, and too much was very little, <coughs> and much less than she used to do. Like last year, we hiked a huge mountain together in Israel, and um, she was told to do much, much less because it was going to waste her muscles. And this was a DM doctor and a PT who wasn't a DM PT, but yeah. So now she's really scared. Right. And I think we've tried really hard to, you know, put forth the, the evidence that has been done. So where does that come from? Where does that... It, it comes from many years ago when okay. um, muscle disorders were first being investigated and first known about, um, you know, they were muscle diseases. And if you exercise muscles, um, they, they could get worse. And I think the, the piece of that that I would say that there may be some truth to, not necessarily in myotonic dystrophy, but in the whole way that people um, like strength training, uh, body lift, bodybuilder type strength training happens is the muscle mass increases by people breaking down their muscle fibers and rebuilding their muscle fibers. And the concern was that in people with muscle disease, if we break down muscle, that it may not rebuild. Um, and that's where the, the guideline of moderate intensity comes in. We're looking at just regular resistance exercise that's not overtaxing. So I think that would be the, the piece that I would say is just if it's, you know, you don't do too much where you're, and what's too much? I guess this is the other question that I often get answered, asked is, you know, things that I would recommend that people look for is muscle soreness that lasts more than 48 hours. It's typical to have muscle soreness. It's typical to have muscle soreness after a new activity. Um, but if it lasts for over 48 hours, then you may have done too much. From a fatigue standpoint, I mean, I know this is really challenging in, in a population with myotonic dystrophy, but um, if, if you do activity on a certain day and go to bed and wake up the next morning, you should feel refreshed, and I know that's really not something that you guys feel on a regular basis. <laughs> um, but you shouldn't feel like you felt the night before. You should feel better than that. And um, so those are the, the kind of the guidelines that I say that's, that's when we're kind of concerned that that's too much activity. And, and the history of it is just because people were concerned originally about taxing a muscle system that is damaged. Um, and I think, you know, as investigators have been able to chip away. I mean, exercise trials are very hard to run. I mean, there's very big ethical concerns. I can't put somebody through a high-intensity exercise program in a research project because we don't know if it's going to cause harm. So we've just been chipping away at the little things that we can find out, and they've gotten to the point where they can safely say that people with myotonic dystrophy, you know, or slowly progressive neuromuscular conditions, which myotonic dystrophy is one of, that resistance exercise and aerobic conditioning is safe. And I mean, certainly the references are on here yeah. on the slides, and I think they'll be on the MDF website. And I guess I would say is bring those to the providers to, to uh, help with that. Are there any other questions? Do, can, so what? Are you aware of any interaction of the statin drugs and exercise in patients with myotonic dystrophy? 
Oh, um, he was asking about uh, statin drugs and exercise. Um, I'm not certain about um, any literature that talks specifically about statin um, drugs and exercise, but I know that there has been more information coming out about statins in general and muscle strength. And I guess I would just refer back to your provider um, about those. So how much time do we have left? got on schedule, we have about three or four minutes. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Then I guess we could just end early. Yeah. <laughs> so, question. Here's a question. Yeah. Well, that's a different session. <laughs> <laughs> Motivation strategies for JOAs. Uh, I can't remember what time. Did it happen already? Which one? Uh, motivation strategies for JOAs, juvenile onset adults. I think so, but I'm not sure. Does anybody see it on the schedule? It might. It's on the far right. 145. Oh, okay. 145. Yeah, so you might want to attend that session. Um, I've never had problems motivating myself. I'm, uh, it's just sort of intrinsic. Maybe it's genetic. Got some good genes somewhere. Uh, how about you, Mike? Well, I think two points that Katie mentioned are important. Do something you like. One o'clock is motiv motivation strategies. Oh, okay. There will be an audio recording and PowerPoint on the MDF website in a couple weeks of that session. I can't promise you'll have answers, but um, Mike, Mike about, is responding. Uh, the, two, the two things that Katie mentioned about uh, do it with somebody else, do something you like. Even that, though, sometimes I think, oh, you know, it's, I don't know if I want to go do that today. I promised myself afterwards a treat. <laughs> like, I, you know, like I get to go to happy hour, <laughs> or um, I get to go to my favorite uh, vegetarian restaurant and, and eat, you know, something that's really good there or whatever. But I make myself a promise afterwards, something that I really enjoy, um, or something that uh, I shouldn't do and I'll indulge. Right? Eat jumbo brownies. <laughs> and Annabelle had an idea. Part of the day. We'd better wrap up now. You've got <laughs> a, about seven, eight minutes before the networking lunch. Uh, please join me in giving a, a warm thank you to Yay. our Yay. great Yay. presenters. Thank you. Uh, thank you. The, the networking lunch features a number of tables with specific topic areas. You can pick the topic you're most interested in discussing <laughs> or hearing about from other community members and lunch will be brought to your table. And we look forward to seeing you uh, in the ballroom at noon. Uh, also, these, these sessions are being recorded. Audio recordings and video, in addition to the slides that you've seen, will be available on the MDF website as well. Thanks. Thanks.